Thanks, Matt, and morning. Uh, I'm always somewhat bemused uh, when water is classified as an emerging asset when you consider throughout most periods of civilization, water has been recognized as a fortress and essential asset. And while it historically hasn't been valued in a financial sense, it's certainly been valued in a defensive and strategic sense. Now, I admit it has been typically challenging to source investments that leverage water aside from some infrastructure or utility type plays. But Australia is quite unique in that it has an established and successful water market framework, which unbeknownst to many, and despite the noise you may see on media occasionally, is viewed as a global leader in sustainably managing our scarce water resources. So it's this water market today that I'll talk about, and I'll talk about how riparian sees value across this market to construct an uncorrelated investment strategy to deliver consistent yield and capture capital growth across this unique set of assets. Now, the Australian water markets have developed into one of the most sophisticated and functional water markets in the world. And this took decades of debate and argument and discussion and a lot of legacy issues to sort out from all sides of the community. But they are considered by many to be the gold standard. Our water markets have endured a range of climatic, economic and political cycles over the last 12 years, and they've demonstrated resilience throughout those changing times. The fundamental drivers I'll talk about today that provide strong tailwinds to water are unrelated to those that drive traditional asset classes. So that leads to a logically low level of correlation with traditional investment strategies. We see water as the irreplaceable input into irrigated farmers, with farmers requiring water every year, even when it's wet. So La Nina periods like we're moving into at the moment don't fundamentally change the outlook for water. So this allows investments in water entitlements to generate reliable annual yields, which is a key attribute of this asset class. They've proven to be relatively stable and they haven't shown, shown any signs of compression to date. Um, a question that often comes up and we'll touch on it a bit later in the presentation is what about the regulatory framework? And that framework continues to evolve, but the fundamentals of those regulations have remained stable again through a variety of cycles, both political, economic and commodity, since the markets were broadly established over um, 12 years ago. Just to try and get you to understand a bit better, which is sometimes a complex uh, theory around water. We, we think it's really quite simple, but we've been investing in this sector for decades now. So for us, it's, it's central to everything we do. But when we talk about water in Australia, we're really referring to two specific assets. The water entitlement, which is the real asset, and the water allocation, which is the annual a yield generating component. So the water entitlement, that uh, long-term in perpetuity um, right or property right, is really um, permanent airspace in a dam. And each of these permanent airspace has a different security class. So um, if you look at the bottom of that slide, you'll see the bottom of the dam is high security, the top of the dam is the lower security. So in um, wet years, you'll have, you'll have water all through the dam. In dry years, you'll only have water in the bottom of the dam. Water allocation is the amount of water that airspace contains each year that we then are available to use, to sell or to lease to farmers. Um, investing in water at a high level really involves quite simply buying a portfolio of these permanent water entitlements, and that's across the Australian irrigated uh, sector, and then either leasing those entitlements or selling the annual allocations to irrigators to generate the income which drives our yields. Now the farmers we sell that water to use it to support the irrigated operations. And really importantly, the volume of water entitlements on issues is capped as a result of the reforms that I touched on earlier. So this means there's a limited amount of water available, i.e. they're not issuing any more lot rights. So the amount of water rights on uh, issue are kept and they've actually been decreasing over time as government buybacks have been in place to support a more sustainable diversion limit. So given water's position as a vital input in irrigated farming, there's strong competition against the users to secure these resources to support their operations. So what that means is if you've got two farmers both requiring water, the farmer that can make the most money per unit of water allocated will outbid the other farmer for that water. And so what we'd like to say is simply water flows uphill to value. Now we break um, the fundamental drivers of water entitlement into two key areas, long-term and short-term categories. These long-term drivers are productivity gains by farmers, uh, 
increasing commodity or agricultural commodity prices, increased demand for water, and in addition, that reducing supply from climate change impacts and government buybacks I talked about. Now, on the other side, the main short-term driver we see is changes in seasonal water supply conditions. So whether it's raining or whether we're in drought. And as you can see from that chart um, on your screens, these long-term drivers have resulted in strong gains along the way, which really leads us to the next slide around what's the performance been since 2018. So the returns here are based on a basket of the major Southern Murray-Darling Basin water entitlements, which is where the majority of the trade takes place. And as you can see, the returns have been strong with capital appreciation of around 8% annualised over that period and annual re yields around 4%. And these yields in particular are one of the key attributes of water entitlements that we think make them particularly compelling in today's low yield environment. And we see plenty of reasons as to why those yields can be sustained in the future. On this slide, you can see the long-term drivers of those water entitlements and a bit more value and what the trends have been. So since 28, uh, areas being planted to higher value, often permanent crops like almonds, citrus and table grapes, have resulted in increased annual demand for water, which according to ABARES has risen by over 3% per year. If we look at our commodity prices, our farmers have been receiving prices for their products that have increased by over 6% per year, according to Rabobank. And again, according to ABARES, our farmers have increased their productivity by almost 2% per year. At the same time, water supply situation has been impacted by factors, including those government buybacks, which has occurred from 2008, and have actually reduced the volume of water entitlements available for farmers to use, and also by climate change, which has led to lower levels of inflows into the river. So to summarise that, um, that slide, demand's been rising while supply's been falling. Sorry about that delay. Uh, so this next slide really talks about supply demand dynamic. And it's, it's really illustrated here by the fact that those green uh, vertical bars you see, that shows the annual demand for water in the Murray system by horticultural crops. So this is tree crops that I talked about. Now the interesting point is since around um, 2015, there's been significant areas, particularly in the Southern Basin, planted to higher value, often permanent crops. So that's the almonds, the citrus, the wine grapes, the table grapes we've talked about. These sort of crops can take up to seven years to mature. And as they mature, they require increasing amounts of water each year. And this is expected to drive the demand for water in the Southern Basin even higher over the coming decade. And that's illustrated by those dark green bars to the right. Now, a drought year, the supply of water in a drought year is represented by that middle gray line. And an average year is represented by that yellow top line that you can see. So it's quite clear to see at some point in the next decade, we're actually going to be in a position where the amount of crop in the ground is gonna demand a larger percentage of water than is able to be supplied. So that really puts this uh, underlying demand on these scarce resources. It's also created what we call a permanency of demand for water, as these crops require water every year. When you've got a almond tree that's cost Thirty to forty thousand dollars a hectare to establish, and it's got a twenty-five to thirty-five year life. You can't afford to not water that crop every year, regardless of the price of that water. So far less um, flexibility in that system, as you can see, compared to ten years ago. And we don't think that this tightening supply and demand dynamic is fully priced into the water markets yet. Again, supporting that rationale for why we think now is a good time to invest in water entitlements. As I talked about, um, the drivers are all related to the agricultural economy, whether that's uh, agricultural commodities, um, demand, uh, productivity, supply issues. They're not correlated to traditional markets. And as um, Firetrail explained, uh, really no correlation in this strategy either to those markets. You can see negative correlations across. So quite simply, water markets are driven by how, farm, how much farmers are willing to pay for water, Again, unrelated to the drivers of traditional investment markets. We'll get to that next slide. So if we look for the outlook um, ahead, 
we're reasonably bullish around uh, the trends driving these water values into the future. Now, we're continuing to see increased areas planted to high value permanent crops, which again increases that annual demand for water on a permanent basis. We continue to see strong demand for Australian grown produce, despite the current tensions with China over certain aspects of our trade. Uh, we continue to see productivity improvements as our farmers are fully incentivized to continue to deliver on the gains we've seen over the past four decades. Finally, we see supply uh, reducing, as I talked about, as a result of both climate change and um, government buybacks that have been implemented. So we've talked a bit about the capital growth drivers. I'll just quickly touch on what, uh, what drives our yield profile. And if you can see on the right hand side of that in the light green of that diagram, what we do is with our portfolio of water, and again, this is a portfolio from the north of Australia to Tasmania that we're building. Um, we, we sell, we lease, we, um, we, long -term, uh, we build long-term risk management tools for growers that they then uh, buy off us. And that's how we generate annual income from that portfolio, which in turn, we, uh, we distribute to investors uh, on a biannual basis. Uh, regulatory risk has been a topic of discussion and, and we often see regulatory risk um, become more prevalent uh, or more prevalent in the media at least during dry periods such as the one we've just been through. Um, the, the regulations have been well established now for over 15 years. Um, while we admit that there's always room for improvement, and we encourage that improvement. Uh, the framework has been supported by a range of reviews, as you can see on the slide there. So we've had reviews from the Productivity Commission through to state governments, through to uh, the most current review, which is the ACCC review, which released its interim report in July. Now that report highlighted the importance of water markets and the value that they have created. It also confirmed the important role that investors play in the function of those markets. Uh, the report pointed to areas where market infrastructure could be improved, and that's the areas around governance and oversight and transparency uh, and access to trade information. And Riparian contributed to that report and we support the outcomes uh, and recommendations to date. Hopefully that report starts to allay um, potential concerns some investors have around regulatory risk. The key other risks that we, um, we see across the market I uh, really relate back to that agricultural economy, um, some of that regulatory risk we talked about and the climate risk. In our view, the ag economy uh, remains strong and demand for food both here and abroad is expected to support this. Uh, we see climate change is actually supportive of that underlying uh, demand profile on water entitlements. And we think volatile weather events actually have more of an impact on the short term rather than the long term. And as we noted, the regulatory risks, in our view, have been significantly reduced with that recent ACCC report. So in summary, uh, we believe water entitlements can provide investors with exposure to the broader Australian agricultural, uh, irrigated agricultural sector. And the beauty of water is it allows exposure and efficient exposure to an entire range of different commodities and the operators who produce them. Investments in a portfolio of water entitlements can provide an improved liquidity profile when compared to some of the more traditional land-based agricultural investments you might be familiar with. And that's because water is tradable um, and the level of turnover of water is quite significant in itself. Having different types of, of entitlements in the portfolio with a focus on leasing um, those entitlements allows us to buffer the volatility around yields or cash distributions from seasons to seasons providing more stable annual yields to investors. And this is in support, supported by increasing demand and capacity to pay for water by those irrigators. Lastly, as highlighted here today, in our view, the fundamental long-term drivers of water that have delivered that strong performance over the past decade remain in place today, and we expect them to continue to support values of water entitlements into the future.